So as always, what I'd like to do is uh, give a review of what we've covered last time and then move on to the new material. So in the last lecture, um, we were going over this, all of these concepts of no arbitrage once again. The fact that uh, in this economy where there are two underlying assets and one is risky and one is risk-free, uh, we show that there's no arbitrage if and only if there exists a probability measure such that the current value is equal to the future value discounted and then taken an expectation under using those probabilities. And these are not real probabilities. And uh, this existence of arbitrage, or the existence of the absence of arbitrage, uh, is equivalent in this model to the assets having a particular ordering, right? You, the the risk-free asset does better than one state and worse than another. And this is equivalent to the fact that the little Q probabilities that we calculated are in the range zero, one. Uh, then in the lecture, we, we talked about this idea of an incomplete market and did some examples and show that there were various bounds um, uh, various bounds on the risk neutral prices that we could find. Uh, the idea here was that since there are three, since there are three possible outcomes, when you write down the risk neutral condition, the risk neutral expectation condition, you find that actually there is multiple choices that could happen. There are many possible measures, not just one. And the Q is not unique in that case. And because of the non-uniqueness of Q, you were able to find non-unique uh, values for contingent claim or for, for other assets. And in this case, the other asset uh, was able to take on some bound. And I, I guess in the example we had, it was somewhere between 0 and 10 for this particular kind of option. And then we discussed the fact that, well, how, since you have a range of prices, what's a reasonable, appropriate, what's a reasonable way to come up with a unique price? What would you yourself do? Because no arbitrage theory is not enough. It doesn't pin us down. And one idea here was to say, okay, let's take a look at all possible portfolios that you can attain by trading in the assets that already exist. And if you look at all possible portfolios that you can attain, in this situation when you have, a three, dement when you have three outcomes, the attainable assets effectively span a plane. And if your claim, if your new asset doesn't lie on that plane, you can't, it's not attainable. But we thought, th thought about the idea, perhaps we can somehow get as close as possible, and as close as possible in some sense. And the sense in which we talk about close as possible is by minimizing, in this case, the L2 distance between the attainable assets, the class of attainable assets, and the asset that you're trying to, to replicate. Okay, so this gives you a particular projection onto this plane, and it allows you to replicate, or allows you to replicate the asset that lies on the plane, and then you claim that is in fact a value that you can assign to the new asset. But there was a key question that I left open-ended, and it's not one that, I, that I'm gonna ask on a test or anything like that, but it's an interesting open-ended question for you to think about, is whether a value associated with the underlying asset, um, whether a value associated with an asset in this type is a reasonable value to you, right? Does it lead to a no, no arbitrage price? It's a reasonable approach, but does it actually give you no arbitrage price? And there's a couple of approaches that you can take to, to answer that question, and I'll leave it uh, for you to discuss, and if you want to ask me, you can go ahead. And uh, then, I believe, we then went on and discussed what to do in multi-period settings. And in the multi-period setting case, we thought of the idea that if you had two time, or multiple time steps at each point, in principle, you can take on two new values. But this led to a computational problem, the computational problem being that the tree at the number of points that you have after stepping out n number of time steps grows exponentially, right? It grows as a power of two. And one way to avoid that is to force your trees to do what's called recombining, and that is when you go up and then down, it, you get to the same state as if when you go down and then up, okay? So this is the idea behind a recombining tree, and the number of nodes that you have the total number of nodes that you have is in fact only quadratic in the number of steps because at every time you have n, so if you sum that up, you get n squared. So that's a nice computational reduction when you go to the multi-step case. Then uh, we were discussing, well, how do you deal with valuation and no arbitrage conditions and so on in the, within the multi-period setting? And the idea was actually quite simple. It said, the idea is to just focus in, if you're at a particular node, say you're at that node where the asset A takes on the value AU, so you're inside that yellow circle, there are only two possible outcomes for you from that node onwards. 
And similarly, for the money market account, there are only two possible values, or for the secondary asset, there are only two possible values for it as well. So focusing in on just that yellow circle, it looks exactly the same as it did for the one period case. So there's no difference. You can just repeat all of your knowledge set from before and apply it in that yellow circle. And then repeat that again, apply it in the little, in the sort of turquoise circle. And then repeat that again, because now you know the asset's value and the, now you know whether or not there's arbitrage or not, or you know the new asset value at the two nodes, um, AU and AD. And then you can repeat the analysis again for the purple circles, because at every particular subset, it's just a binomial tree. There's nothing new. And in fact, I'm going to be a little bit more explicit about this um, later on today when we look at American options and we look at past dependent options and when we'll also talk about some simulations. Okay, so we're going to go back to this and do some more examples and a little more details on it in a bit. But that's the basic idea, is that you simply have to focus in on each part of the tree and if you're asking a question about no arbitrage, you would make sure that all of the Q probabilities that you got from these branches are in fact, or all of these cues that you get by imposing risk neutrality are in fact probabilities. In other words, that they are in the range 0, 1. And then if you can find such cues and they don't have to be the same, in general they won't. If you can find such cues, then, then, you, ask, then you do have an arbitrage-free model and you can go on and value some new contingent claim in the same way as before. So either use a risk neutral expectation on the new claim or on the new asset, or do a replicating portfolio. Again, focus in on just the two nodes, or sorry, focus in on any one node which just takes on two possible values, in which case it reduces to your old analysis again. Okay? So uh, that's where we discussed uh, for the multi-period case, and that naturally led to the situation of, well, what if we were to take this model and actually try to replicate some behavior that we see in the real world, uh, what features would you try to replicate? And at a first-order analysis, you're going to try to replicate at least the mean and the variance of the returns of your underlying asset. And we discussed this fact that there are two ways that you could look at returns, either as absolute returns, so the difference divided by the initial value, or the logarithm of the ratio. And I also mentioned that these two are more or less the same, up to some small corrections. Uh, for the purpose of uh, the analysis, it's much easier to deal with the logarithm. So we use the logarithm, uh, logarithmic return, and what we want to impose on our tree model is uh, we would like to impose that the expected return in our tree model is also equal to the historical return that we have observed. So this quantity, these starred quantities, mu star minus a half sigma star squared times delta t, that's our historical quantity. And the variance, we also want our model to match this variance. This is our historical variance. And uh, the approach that we then took was said, well, if we have a simple binomial tree which recombines, one way to do that is to have the asset grow up or down by the same factor. And then uh, we would like to choose that factor and choose the probabilities so that we match these first two moments. So matching these first two moments are the key aspect of this analysis. So once you've matched those first two moments, and you do this to order little delta t, the lowest order that you can. Uh, in other words, the most important contributions are what you keep. What we found uh, after doing some of this analysis is this very nice result, that the probability is approximately a half. It's not exactly. It's a half plus a correction term that depends on the drift and the volatilities. And that correction term is also of order square root delta t. As well, the up and down ticks if you want to call it a tick up and down uh, of the asset, is proportional to square root delta t in log space. Okay? And the coefficient of proportionality of the up and down tick in log space is actually the volatility. So sigma star is your vol. So once we've been able, so then when we did this analysis, we then achieved our initial goal, that is create a binomial model that recombines, that replicates the behavior that we've seen in the market, at least the mean and the variance. It replicates that. And then we want to go on and ask, okay, what about the continuous time limit of this model? Suppose we took the time steps going to zero. What do we end up with? So we then said, okay, let's take our time, break it up into a whole bunch of pieces, write down our asset price in terms of all of these little increments of whether we went up or down, that's these little X Bernoulli random variables. And by central limit theorem, basically, we were able to say that the distribution 
of, uh, we can write, sorry, the asset price is as A times the exponential of some random variable, the terminal asset price as A times the exponential of a random variable, and by central limit theorem, that random variable is normally distributed, and our goal was to figure out what, what's the mean and what's the variance of that normal. We then went ahead to that calculation, and the end result is right here, actually. There we go. So we found that the distribution of X under the measure P is normal with that particular mean and, the vari and that variance that shows up there. Now, from the start, we had this sort of weird convexity correction term that I had written in terms of the historical mean. You might remember, let me slide back here, when I, when I wrote down the expected value of the log returns, I didn't call that mu star delta T. I called it mu star adjusted by convexity, mu star minus the half sigma squared, and everything times delta t. And I said, just take it at fate. There's a reason that I've chosen it to be that. I could choose it to be anything, but I'm calling it this. And the reason then becomes evident once we've got this continuous time model, and we know the distribution of the underlying asset is the exponential of a normal with that mean and that variance. And then if we compute the expected value of that underlying asset, what we found was that the expected value of the underlying asset is in fact the initial value grown at the rate of mu star. And it only grows at the rate of mu star because we had that convexity correction. If you didn't include the convexity correction in the definition of mu star, what you'd end up with is the expected return of the asset being equal to mu star plus a half sigma star squared. So that was the underlying reason for including it in the first place. Okay? And I believe, yeah, good. And then we did one last calculation, and that was take, um, now that we've got a model that replicates the historical behavior of the underlying asset uh, under the P measure, we now want to do derivative valuation. So we want to somehow value new contingent claims or new assets. And in order for us to do that, we have to introduce the risk neutral measure. So we then said, let's calculate the risk neutral measure induced by such a model. We compute the Q, and we have this nice exact expression, but we can play the same game as before. We're going to take delta T to zero, so let's do some asymptotics on that. You carry out the asymptotic expansion, and what you find is that the Q probability here looks exactly the same form as the P probabilities did when we did this calibration, except instead of mu star, you have R. And that's kind of a nice thing. It, it sort of corresponds to uh, the intuition that we had about the risk-neutral probabilities. The risk-neutral probabilities tell us that the rate of return of assets in terms of Q probabilities is equal to R. So it's nice and comforting to see that Q, in fact, it doesn't have mu star in it at all. It only has R. It doesn't depend on the P measure in some sense. The probability P only really depends on R. Right? It depends on the sigma stars and so on, but that really defines your state space. So the real degree of freedom in the probabilities P is R, is the rate of, uh, sorry, is mu star. It's the rate of growth. And here we see that rate of growth mu star getting replaced by the risk-free one. And that's something we'll see happening again, even in the continuous time setting, when we start to, when we introduce Brownian motions and go through the whole continuous time dynamic hedging. You'll see this happen again, that the risk neutral measure induces something which changes anything that had to do with real world drift, new stars, into R. They'll all get changed into R somehow, some sort of magical thing that happens. But it happens from a completely different perspective when we do the dynamic hedging approach. Okay, so we ended up finally then saying uh, that under the Q measure, the asset still has a log normal distribution because the form of Q is the same as it was for P. So obviously the, the asymptotic limits, the limits when we, take up, when we take A and compute the distribution will be exactly the same as what we found under P, but instead of mu, you have R. So this result is nothing. You don't have to do much work to do this. You can just quote your old result and say the asset A under Q has this distribution and we've, this is where we've landed. Okay, so that's a sort of synopsis of, of a number of things that we did last time. Um, do we have any questions that I can address or issues that you'd like clarified about the analysis so far? Crystal clear? Okay. 
Okay, so we'll begin with our new lecture today. Oh, actually, there was one more thing here. Yeah, that was your quiz. Okay, well, I'll, I posted the solution, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so what I want to do today uh, is a number of things, actually. I, I want to derive for you the Black-Scholes pricing equation, which is actually a very simple calculation, and um, discuss how uh, various option payoffs behave in terms of their prices without using any mathematics, just sort of intuitively looking at them and trying to figure out how they actually behave. And then I would like to discuss um, American options and optimal exercise boundaries associated with them and uh, some path-dependent options. Okay. So that will sort of be our, our little outline for today. Okay, so the first part is on black shows. And again, I think this is something that perhaps 90% or more of you have already seen, so I'm not going to go slow. I'm just going to go quickly through it. Um, if you have questions, ask me. So the, the analysis that we're going to do first is let's take a call option. And what we'd like to do is we want to value a call on an underlying asset, S, and the strike is K, and the maturity is sometimes capital T, okay? So how are we going to uh, approach this? Well, we know that the value of this call option has to be equal to, and uh, for now, we're just going to use a constant interest rate. So, it's some, so think of R as the spot interest rate for maturity capital T. We know that this has to be the expected value under the measure Q of a function of that payoff. And what is my payoff? Sorry, the expectation of the payoff itself. What is the payoff? It's this. It's just S capital T minus K, right, for a call option. Now we know, and this is under the measure Q. Now from the analysis that we've done last time, we know that this equals in distribution the initial value of S times the exponential of a normally distributed random variable with a mean, so let me just um, slide back here to remind you of the, where is it? Uh, there we go. We showed this result that the underlying asset has this mean and this variance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it instead of using a non-standard normal random variable, I'm going to write it in terms of a standardized normal random variable. It's always easiest and best to do that. So this becomes R minus one half. And I'm not going to bother to put the, the little asterisks, the stars on things anymore. They're, it's not necessary, right? The point of using the asterisks before was to emphasize the fact that that was coming from data, right? It's an estimate based on data, and that is my you know, estimator of the variance. But now we have a model, so let's just get rid of the asterisk and say, I don't care if you got it from data or you just picked it out from the model. I don't care. So we know that uh, this in distribution uh, has to be equal to sigma square root, or th that's the mean, and that's the variance. Uh, and this variable here that I'm introducing is just some standardized normal under the measure Q. And our whole goal now is really simply to compute that expectation. That's the, the goal of the calculation. But at this point, I could actually just say, okay, here's the answer, just write it down for you. Um, because there's no more financial theory that goes into this anymore. It's, we're done with financial theory. It's only basic math, first year calculus. But since the first time we do it, I do it for you explicitly anyway, okay? So let's go ahead and just compute the expected value. Well, the way that I like doing this is to write this expectation in two terms. Okay, remember, what does the little subscript plus mean? It means whatever is in the argument, if it's positive, otherwise it's zero. So I can also write that simply as S minus K if S, my, if S is bigger than K, otherwise it's zero. Remember this little, uh, this, this, this uh, one script, by definition, this is an indicator function, right? This is zero, or this is one, if A is true. So if A occurs, and it's zero otherwise, okay? That's just my, that's the notation that I use for it. So this expectation, there are two terms in it. There's the expectation of this term, 
and the expectation of the second term. Okay. Now, now we can go ahead and just use standard calculus, but we can do something even better. The second term here, what's the expected value of an event that, of the indicator of an event? Well, it's one if the event occurs, zero if it doesn't occur. The expected value of such random variable is simply the probability that that event occurs. So this is in fact just the Q probability, because this is the Q expectation that S is bigger than K. So for this one, we actually don't have any work to do. We simply write down, uh, since we, we, know it, we know that, that the S at maturity is equal in distribution to that expression at the top of the screen, therefore I can simply write this as Q. I can insert that expression in there, take logarithms, subtract out the mean, and rearrange it so that I isolate the only random variable, which is Z. Okay, so this is the same thing as Z is greater than negative log S over K um, plus R minus a half sigma squared T all over sigma square root T. Okay. That's just the same thing. I've just done a few lines of algebra for you in all at once. And then you recognize, well, Z is standard normal. So this is the upper tail probability, which is actually the same thing as the lower tail probability of negative the point, and let me just sketch that for you. That's my normal distribution. So whatever this number is, I don't know, call that thing Z star, okay? I'm looking for the probability of that event from a standard normal, and I can, of course, take that same thing and just reflect it and that's identical to the probability of the reflected event because it's a standard normal, right? It's completely symmetric. Oops. So this is minus Z star. And I've written it, I've drawn it as if Z star was negative, but that's just the way I've drawn it. So that's the same probability. And therefore, you can write that in terms of the standard normal CDF of negative Z star. In other words, of log S over K Okay? And this is the standard normal CDF. Often in this course, capital Phi will represent standard normal CDF. In fact, it will always represent standard normal CDF. So you've got one term of that expectation. Now you just need the other term, expected value of S times the indicator. Okay, it turns out that you can actually do this calculation as well without writing down a single integral by using some ideas of measure changes. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on that today. If you want to see that, come see me during my office hours. I'll explain to you how that works. But we'll just do it instead by direct integral calculations. So what I do is I condition on the little z random variable, and I know that f at capital T in distribution is this plus sigma square root t times little z in the event that, well, since I introduced that little variable z star up there, the event that s is bigger than k is the same as the event that little z is bigger than z star. So I can always write it that way, times the density of little z, or times the density of the standard normal, sorry. Okay, any questions there? straightforward plug-in of the distributional property of S capital T. And uh, of course, that truncation in the integral, that's, well, all that indicator does is truncates the integral. And I can pull out a bunch of constants here. That part's constant. And the integral goes from Z star 
to plus infinity, e to the sigma square root t z, and I'll collect both exponential terms together, one half, um, sorry, one half z squared. And the trick in all of these kinds of integrals, it, I mean, if you want to call it a trick at all, is just to complete the square in the exponential. It's a quadratic function of z. So you can complete the square and you'll end up with a new quadratic function of z without a linear term. And then you can shift it and do the integral. So let's work on just the integral. So that's z star, that's e to the minus one half z minus sigma square root t all squared plus one half sigma squared t. Okay. So you can convince yourself that that indeed is is what happens when you complete the square, right? If I if I square that term, I'll get minus a half z squared. That's the term that was there before. If you look at the cross term, that gives me minus two sigma square root tz times minus a half, so that's plus sigma square root tz, and that's the term that we had before. And then there's a quadratic term on the sigma, which gives me minus a half sigma squared t, and the plus a half sigma squared t cancels that. Okay, so this is uh, identical. And now uh, it's a matter of shifting the integral. So first of all, there's a constant part that can be pulled out. Introduce a new variable, call it z prime. Z prime is z minus sigma square root t. Okay. And the Jacobian for that transformation is one. All right. It's just linear coefficient one. So this is z star minus, sorry, minus sigma square root t. Whoops. The plus infinity, e to the minus one half. Uh, z prime squared, dz prime over square root two. And then again, you can recognize that integral as the upper tail probability of a standard normal. And uh, so you can rewrite it again in terms of the standard normal CDF of negative of that value. And if you simplify if you just plug back in what z star in fact is, you would get log s minus k you end up with that expression. And then if you put this together with your previous result, you find that the final value is, um, actually let's scroll back up again for a second. One thing that you notice is this fact, this i function it has a, it's, there's a probability, but then there's this exponential factor out front, and that exponential factor exactly cancels the minus a half sigma square that showed up up there on the second line. You see it's S0 e to the r minus a half sigma squared t. So that exponential factor down in front of the probability will cancel the exponential, the convexity correction term there. And so the end result is you just get phi, and I'm going to write this thing, I'm going to introduce a new constant called d plus. It's the usual constants that you see in a Black-Scholes equation. And d minus, and what are they? Well, this is just log of this ratio, plus r plus or minus a half sigma squared t, all over sigma squared t. Okay. So this is our Black-Scholes price. or the Black-Scholes formula for a call option. Okay. Questions? Now you could also do this uh, for a put option. So maybe I'll put a little C up there just to denote the fact that that's a call. And I'll put a little P here. And if you do, if you do the calculation for put, you end up with, um, with this expression.
okay? Has a very, very similar form. All right, so you've all, I think, have seen this at some point. And uh, what I'd like to do um, is uh, something that you may not have seen, I'm not sure how much of it you've seen, is looking at the behavior of this particular option as a function of, as, as certain parameters change. And then trying to understand what happens if you try to build values of other type of contingent claims that are not so obvious. They're not like a standard call or a standard put. They have slightly different behavior or slightly different shapes. How would you figure out how to sketch their prices? And that's what we'll investigate next, unless there's questions about this formula. Okay, so let's address a couple of the questions or a couple of the behaviors. So first of all, uh, let's look at, we'll look at call and then we'll look at put. And what I'm drawing here is the initial asset price or the asset price at some point in time. And over here, we're going to draw the value at some point in time. Now, at maturity, you know that this is simply the call payoff, right? We end up with a straight line call payoff function. So this is at, this is V at maturity. Now, if we're at some point prior to maturity, if you look at, uh, you know, two weeks before maturity, then this call function, this call price function, has a shape that, sorry, I'm not drawing it too well, there we go, has a shape that looks like that. And the question is, does that asymptotically approach the payoff or not? Hmm? Asymptotically approaches the payoff? Yes, I see some yeses. Okay, the answer is no. It actually approaches a different straight line. It approaches, um, let me uh, relabel this thing. This is at maturity. And if there's capital T left to maturity, so this is a time to maturity, this red curve will asymptotically approach that straight line. And that straight line is, it shifted, right? It hits the axis at K discounted. That's K, and over there is K e to the minus RT. And the way that you can see that, the way that you can think about that, is um, from a financial perspective, you can say, well, I know that the call option, if the asset is extremely high in value, the optionality embedded in there has pretty much no value. Right? If I'm very far off to the right, then really all I have as a payoff is S minus K. The fact that this is S minus K and then um, gets flat if it goes below zero doesn't really affect me because I'm so far deep in the money. Right? If, the, if your current asset price is way out here, then all you really see is just a straight line. Right? You don't see this little protection. You don't see this protection part here. All you see is a straight line that continues out very, very far out. Okay? And you can formalize that by saying, well, the payoff of the call is clearly bounded below by, um, sorry, I need a pen here. It, the payoff of the call option, phi call, is always greater than or equal to the asset price at maturity minus K. You agree? It's always greater than or equal to that. That S minus K is a straight line that does that. So clearly the payoff is always bigger or equal to that. So if there's no arbitrage in the market, the value of the call option has to be more valuable than something which will pay me S minus K. And what kind of portfolio can I build that pays S minus K? Well, if I hold one unit of the asset today and I owe K dollars in the future, then in the future, the value of that that portfolio would be S minus K because 
on that date in the future, I would be owing K dollars, that's the minus K. I have the asset in my hand, I can sell it, and that gives me F. So right now, what's the value of owning one unit of the asset and owing K dollars in the future? What's the value? Someone tell me, what's the value? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right, well, minus, right? So there's a minus there and that, yeah. So, and this here is just my value of the call, right? The value of the payoff of the call, receiving that in the future is the value of the call today. So I have this inequality. So this tells me that the call has to be bounded below by that straight line. And then arguing that asymptotically it actually approaches a straight line, you just simply do the, take the limits, right? Take the limit as S gets infinitely large. The probability of the event that I drop below K goes to zero, and therefore I should asymptotically approach that equality there. This equality becomes strict equality, becomes binding for large S. Because for large S, there's zero chance that I would actually drop below K. You can imagine that, right? If I have the larger and larger my current level of the asset price is, the much less likely, the smaller and smaller the probability is of the event occurring that I fall below K. And it's only those events below K which cause the payoff to be more valuable than than this little portfolio. Right? It's, only because, it's only because of this part here that you have an inequality. Right? See, that's the S minus K, and the yellow portion is where the call is more valuable than that little portfolio. And so, if S is very large, the probability of getting into the yellow region gets to be very small and therefore this, bond, this bound becomes binding. So you know asymptotically approaches. Now that's not a formal, a rigorous proof or anything, but I'm not trying to do rigorous proofs here. I'm trying to give you intuition. Questions about that? Okay, well you could extend that idea then and then uh, answer the question, what happens to the call price as maturity increases? So let's say, let's compare, so we know that, we know that asymptotic, we know that the value of the call, it's going to look something like that, and this is approaching that straight line. Suppose I had another call that had twice the maturity date, maturity twice in the future. So this was the one-year call price, the red line. And I want to, I want to draw a purple line that's the two-year call price. Where, where would it lie? Should lie off to the left, right? Should lie off to the left and I'll have something that goes like that, and this would asymptotically approach the straight line where the discount factor is a two-year discount factor. The red line would be for the one-year discount factor, right? So this would be e to the minus r2, for example, if we talked about the two-year, and this would be s minus k e to the minus r times one, okay? Because clearly the discounted value of k over two years is smaller than the discounted value of k over one year, and so the line moves off to the left. Do we agree? Make sense? Okay, so let's see if we can repeat that argument for a put option. And um, then I'm going to try to use uh, a formalized argument to show you this, uh, this inequality with Jensen's inequality, basically. Okay, so for a put, We know that the payoff of a put looks like this. And if I ask for the price at some earlier date, how do I figure out, should it be positive here? Should it be zero? If I'm in this region, out here. The put matures in a year from now. Should clearly be positive, right? Because the put never gives me a negative value and Therefore, it should always have a positive value. 
The payoff is always is positive under some events. Therefore, I should be paying for that. That's basically the idea. Now, the further I move off to the right, the lower that value is because the less likely it is that I end up in the money. Okay, so we know that here it's kind of, it's got to be increasing in this direction or decreasing for large as S increases, increasing as I move towards zero. Now the question is, there's a couple of options that, that we could have here. One is, it could look like that. Another is, it could look like that. Another is, it could look like that. And of course, it could also do that. In principle, those are, those are features. Now what makes financial sense? Or I should post it the other way. Which of these don't make financial sense and why? Okay, so what about this? Does that one make financial sense? Why not? Is it decreasing in S? Is the value decreasing in S? In S not? It's pretty much that, right? The value is a decreasing function of S not. Why? Because forget about the explicit Black Scholes formula. The explicit Black Scholes formula is a bit of a mess, right? You look at that and then you're trying to answer oh sorry, there's an S zero there, right? You're trying to answer whether this increases or decreases with S. But S appears in a few places. Appears here, appears here, and it appears there, which means it also appears there and there. So it's not obvious from that expression. But if you go back to the representation of the price as an expectation, then, then it should become quite clear. The price is the expected, since we're talking about a fixed maturity, the discount factor doesn't affect anything. The expectation under Q of S zero e to the r minus a half sigma squared t plus sigma square root t times z minus k. Right, it's that. Oh, sorry, k minus this. That's the call. Uh, how do I want to do that? Okay, there we go. Okay, so as S increases, S0, that's my, my current spot price, as that increases, clearly this function decreases. And you're taking an expectation, but that doesn't change anything. The expectation is a linear operator. So for as I increase S, my payoff decreases, therefore the value will decrease. So it's a decreasing function. Very simply. So you can't have this funny kink. You can't decrease and then increase. Now, it could in principle become, um, it could have like sort of sharp edges to it and so on in principle, but you can prove that that's not the case either. You can use convexity arguments, right? This payoff is a convex function and you can use convexity to argue through Jensen's inequality that you get convexity as well. But we won't go there. You can just intuitively think that, yeah, it's, the payoff is this blue shape and the expectation is what you're computing, so you're kind of smoothing that blue shape out. So you should get something that's kind of smooth and now we know it should be decreasing. So now the question is, should it be decreasing but starting above, at, or below the blue um, curve when you get to zero asset price? In other words, am I above, below, or at that point? Okay, let's get votes. So for option number one, two, and three, how many ones do we get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, we got about eight or so, eight or ten, something like that. Okay, what about option number two? Any takers? No twos? What about number three? It's like about four or five. Okay, come on, somebody from the non-participating the non group, What's the, what, what do you think the behavior should be? One, two, or three. Okay, so somebody from the group that thinks it should be number one, 
Why? Why do you think that? Anybody from who thinks it's number one? What's the intuition? No one wants to provide any? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so if you're before maturity, then there should be some time value in the option. The fact that the optionality still exists in some sense, right? Okay, it's a potential argument. Now, well, since we got nobody saying number two, I'll skip that. What about number three? Someone from the group who thinks that three is correct, what's the uh, intuition? Mm -hmm. Okay, assuming it stays at zero forever. Okay. Okay, kind of in the right direction, sort of, but not quite. So you're so the, the correct answer is three. Okay, one, you'll see why, why time value is not sufficient to make it stay above. Okay, but the, the reason why three is correct, it's a very simple argument. Look at this. Let's delete, let's delete those two. Is that line a bound for my put option? Is it an upper bound? It's clearly an upper bound, right? So again, phi for the put is less than or equal to k no matter what the asset price is at maturity. Current value of K. If I owe K, if I, if I have something that gives me K dollars in the future, what is it that I have in my hand now? I have a bond, right? How much does that bond cost? K E to the minus R T. Agree? If I get the put payoff in the future, what do I have in my hand? The value of the put. The value of the put has to be less than or equal to the discounted value of K. Well, the discounted value of K is going to be somewhere like that. Okay. And in fact, the way that I've drawn it there is exactly this here. Okay. So it has, the put price has to lie below that straight line. So at zero, it cannot go above it for sure. So the time value that's in the put is there, but it's only there if the underlying asset price is large enough. If it's too small, then it's actually more valuable to immediately exercise the put. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, what was being said before, you could also think about it from the perspective that if the asset is zero dollars right now, it will remain zero because that's how our model is designed, right? S0 equals zero, then all future asset price is zero. And if it's zero now and I hold it to maturity, then the underlying asset price is zero and the put would pay me K dollars. So in fact, if the asset is zero, I get K at maturity and the current value of that is K discounted. So I know as well that this point has to be exactly there. It's not just a low, it's not just an upper bound in fact, is exactly there. So this is kind of what you're trying to get at, this replicating idea, but it's not really replicating. It's something more simple. It's just if the asset zero, it's always zero. At maturity, you, the put will pay you K. What's the value of getting K in the future? The value of a bond now. That's it. Okay? So this is our, these are our two bounds. That's K, K e to the minus RT. Okay? So if I, if I have a put that um, has a longer maturity date, then you're going to get decreased even more over here, and you're going to get increased value over here. So this will still asymptotically go down to zero. Maybe I should draw that in a different color. Uh, okay, this is still going down to zero, and they don't cross at the same point. I hope it doesn't look like that in the picture. Okay, the crossover point there is not the same. 
So these are two different discount times. So this may be a two-year contract and this may be a one-year contract. So for put, you have an odd behavior that you get increases of prices in this direction and decreases in prices in that direction as maturity increases. For small enough for asset values, it decreases. For larger asset values, it increases. And then there's some sort of bound in there in between. Eventually, eventually time value of money is going to wipe everything and make them zero. You can imagine if this exists out to infinite maturity dates, it's going to eventually come down to zero because that purple line will shift all the way down. So here, I should have drawn that in here. As T increases for a call, it just always goes up. Okay, any questions about this behavior? Okay, let's do a couple more before we go for our first break. Um, let's think about interest rates. Let's suppose, so we're at a fixed maturity date. Maturity is out to some fixed time, one year out. We're looking at a call option. With one interest rate level, we have that. Let's say that's the 5% interest rate level. Now let's suppose we increase the interest rates. What's going to happen with the call price? Is it going to decrease? Is it going to increase? And how would you figure that out? I'm writing stuff down to give you hints. Okay. That's the call price. It's, it, it's equal to this expectation. And we know it's explicit formula in terms of a Bach Scholes formula, but again, R appears in too many places. It's difficult to tell what it does. But from this expression, can you tell? Look. If you take this and you multiply it through, it's going to multiply through this term and it will multiply through that term. Agree? When it multiplies through the first term, look, there's a positive R there. There's a positive R times T there. So this will cancel that. You agree? So the only place that R actually shows up after pulling it through is in that second term is in the K term. Now can you answer the question? Oh, yeah, that's correct, yeah. So what happens? as I increase R. As I increase R, I reduce this K discounted, and that's something that's being subtracted from my asset price. So I'm subtracting a smaller number. That means the whole thing is getting bigger, so the asset price should increase, right? Or the option price should increase. So if R goes up, the underlying asset price should go up. Okay. Oops. But I'm still asymptotically, I have to approach the, um, well, not the same line, but the same form. So this is S minus K E to the minus R T. That's my asymptotics there. And here it's also, but I just have two different R's, right? One is R, let's call that R2. Call that one R1. And R2 is bigger than R1. So you can see, even from this bound, this asymptotic bound that we talked about before, you can get the same relationship that the price has to increase. What about for put? Hmm? 
Can you answer the question without me going through the detail now? For put. Let's say this is one interest rate level. If I increase the interest rate, what's going to happen? Decrease, right? It's going to decrease. And in fact, it should lie below at every level. If you think about the same basic, the same formula there, except the the K, the K term and the S term are interchanged, right? You're, you're getting a smaller number and you're subtracting the same thing from it in every event. So you're going to get something that is smaller in every event. That's R increasing. And here, R increasing. Now, volatility is a harder one to actually think about from this expression. If we asked, what about um, as volatility increases? If I look at that expression, it's not at all obvious, is it? Because vol appears in two places. There's a coefficient in front of z, but then there's also that sort of little convexity correction term, the minus a half sigma squared term. And the only way to actually figure it out is to explicitly compute the derivative with respect to volatility. And I'm not going to do that here, not today. We may do it at another time. Tell you the answer. The answer is that for both puts and calls, as volatility increases, the price increases. One way to think of that is when there's more variability in the outcome, the option has more value. That's sort of a generic way to think of it. When there's more variability in the outcome, the option actually has more value. So this is one level of volatility, and then we'll have another level of volatility. And this time, the asymptotics of both of these have to be the same because the interest rate hasn't changed. Okay. The interest rate hasn't changed, so they both asymptotically approach the same line. And this is sigma increasing. And for the put, you have the same, uh, I, as I said already, as sigma increases for a put, you find that the price also increases. But, what about with zero asset price? Initial asset price. It's got to be the same, right? When S equals zero, the price doesn't depend on vol. No matter how volatile it is, the initial price is zero. Whoops, sorry. So this will have to lie strictly above, in fact. It's got to touch there, and we've got to get an increase in price. for sigma increasing. Okay, so I think we've done all of the parameters that, that, that I'd like to talk about right now. Sorry? Well, time's not really a parameter, is it? Time is not a parameter. Time is actually the flow of time. And we talked about that effectively when we addressed the issue of what happens as maturity increases. You could view time flowing forward uh, the same as, sorry, can we have the chatter down? I didn't um, release you as yet. Um, so if, if we have a fixed maturity and we just let time flow forward, that's the same thing as maturity getting shorter. In this sort of stationary model, time flowing forward is identical to thinking of an option with a shorter maturity date. So if you want to understand the variability of time, you just look at this graph. T increasing is, big T increasing is the same thing as little t getting smaller. Or in other words, if little t gets larger, I would go the opposite way. Right? As little t approaches maturity, I have to eventually hit the option payoff. Okay? 
And in fact, you can draw a nice little 3D graph as a function of time, if you wanted to, of, of actual time. You could do something like this. You can say, this is T here, this is capital T there, this is the underlying asset price, and this is value. And what you would end up with is a surface. Okay, so you know at maturity, you have to end up with that. And let's actually draw it with a steeper line, like that. And it's going to increase as I move away from here and curve on the, the projection onto, the, onto this um, VS axis has to be a curve, whoops, has to be this increasing curve. And I'm doing something like that. Okay. So you'll get some sheet that looks like this. And that shouldn't, yeah, that goes more or less to zero. You get a sheet that looks like that. So this is like a, uh, a nice smooth sheet that eventually becomes kinked at the end. Maybe I'll, I'll actually, when you come back from the break, I'll, I'll throw up a 3D graph for you. Okay? Okay, so now we can take a break. Twist. I'll show you some 3D plots of um, the option prices as a function of time and um, asset price. So in this graph here on the left, this is a call option. And uh, it's the call option price in this axis here, down here, this is the assets price, the underlying asset price. On the vertical axis is the price of the option. And time is flowing forward here. And one is the maturity date of that option. So, excuse me, prior to one, you can see the price is positive and it's pretty smooth. And as you approach maturity, if you look at the contours here, right, you can see that uh, the contours, if you look at the constant color, this moves in closer and closer and closer to here. So this is where the zero, or sorry, the, not the zero, but the contour constant price moves in. And it approaches and eventually becomes zero in this case. And uh, here we can see that the smoothness that you have in this payoff becomes a kink. And the way that I coded this up in such a quick way you don't really get that uh, maturity date point showing up because there's a little bit of a singularity there. So I need to correct that by, um, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, there we go. So that's my put. I've now corrected that little singularity. So you can see it's not, it's not going up to exactly one. It's going up to some point that's a little bit less than one. But it's smoothing out and becomes eventually that kinked behavior. Well, for the put, which is on this side, you can see the put's always bounded above by discounted value of 50. And if I rotate this, let me see if I can. For some reason, the machine is being a little bit slow. And it's not responding very well to uh, there. Okay, but from this perspective, you can see what I wanted to show you. Look, this is close to maturity, right? And the payoff, you're getting the payoff almost exactly. There's not quite a kink here yet, but it will, it will get kinked if we went closer and closer to maturity. Uh, what I wanted to show you was this value at um, a zero asset price, which is, on, which is along this dotted line here. And at zero asset price, you can see the put price decreases as we move away from maturity. As you approach maturity, it goes toward it. So that's exactly the behavior that uh, we were discussing here in the second graph, right, in this one here. You can see that as we went away from maturity, the put initial price goes down, and that's what we're seeing there. But as we go away from maturity here, the price in this region goes up. So this is, uh, I think you can take this home as a, as a good snapshot of how it behaves. And that's where your time value is, is coming in. But the time value is also being affected by discounting. And this is why you get these things compensating with one another. All right. Uh, so uh, what I wanted to do, that took a bit longer than I was expecting. But I don't want to skip over what I wanted to do next. Uh, so I will cover it in any case. And I may have to push one of the topics to next class that I imagined to do today. So what I wanted to do now is look at 
other payoffs that are a little bit non-standard and see if we can try to guesstimate or, or get an idea of how those non-standard payoffs should behave. And I'll pull up for you as well an Excel spreadsheet that will allow you to view how they do actually behave. So let's see. Let's take a payoff that will start off with something relatively simple. Okay, this is slope plus one and a slope of minus one, and that's a strike of K. Now, this type of payoff, I believe it's called a strangle. I can never remember if it's strandle, strangle or straddle. They're very similar related. Someone, strangle? Straddle. Okay, straddle. So we have a straddle. And you can build this, of course, out of a put struck at K and a call struck at K with the same maturity date. And so here's the question, how should this behave as a function of asset price? Some fixed maturity, it matures in a year from now. Well, you know at zero, the asset price has to get discounted, right? You're going to get K dollars for sure, right? If the asset is currently zero, we'll just be stuck at zero, and, you'll, and the put portion of this will end in the money, you'll get exactly K dollars. Asymptotically out here, you know that the put portion, which is bounded, if I'm asymptotically large, the put portion of the payoff has a probability zero of occurring. And so asymptotically, it should behave just the same as a call. So we know asymptotically out here, I should get that. And I know that um, as well, for very small asset prices, it's extremely unlikely that the asset will end in the money for the call option, right? It's very unlikely that the asset will get large enough so that the call payoff takes an effect. So initially, at least, it has to start decreasing just like it does for a put. So there's got to be some sort of decreasing portion. And then eventually, it's got to turn around and start looking like a call. So it's sort of a blend of these two things. And exactly where, whoops, Exactly where it turns around, oh, damn it. <laughs> exactly where it turns around is not going to be too obvious. You can't really pick it out. You'd have to actually do a numerical calculation. Okay. So we should find a payoff that, or a price that looks like that. And this point here is, of course, K e to the minus RT. Okay, what about... Let's look at a strangle. So strangle looks very much like a straddle, except it's got two strikes. And how should those behave? What should the price function look like for this? Yeah? More or less the same, but it should it should be a little more flat in the middle, right? It should be a little bit more flat. It should behave more like, kind of like the put and then start to turn around and behave like the call. And asymptotically here, it would be K2. And that point is K1 discounted. Okay. Let's try one more. What about, um, oops, I want to draw this in blue. This guy, this is a, called a beer spread. How should that behave? Well, if I'm very far away over here, I know that the, the value should go down to zero, right? Asymptotically. And since this is also bounded above by, by whatever level that is, let's call that level L, okay? 
then I know that if the asset price is zero, this also has to be the discounted version of L initially. And it's got to decrease. The question is, does it decrease? Does it, does it do that, this kind of behavior? Does it do that kind of behavior? What should happen? If you think about the expectation operators more or less smoothening the payoff, that's what you should expect. You more or less get a smoothening of this payoff function. So it actually changes curvature. It's not always convex. It's convex and it's concave. One region is convex, the other region is concave. So you end up with these kinds of behaviors. Now, on the website, I've uploaded a number of things for you, by the way. There's some old problem sets that these used to be required for handing in at one point, but we've stopped that. So you can take a look at some old problems, as well as some old term tests. Why am I pointing that out? Let's pull up a term test, and I don't have a connection. <laughs> it lost. Hopefully it will reconnect in a second. Yeah, this wire is not very... Um, it doesn't have a click. Okay, well, we'll wait until that connects. The point is, is that the term test, I always ask a question of this kind. Always ask you a sketching question from option payoffs. I'll give you a payoff and I'll ask you sketch it. It's behavior. Okay, it looks like it's back up. There we go. This is your term test. There's some true false as before. So here's a question that's uh, asking about sketch the option price as a function of the current spot level for maturities zero, one month, and one year. The exact times are irrelevant. Okay, obviously, you're not going to know what is the exact one month. The point is, I just simply want you to plot or sketch for three different maturities. Maturity, the actual maturity date, it's one year out to maturity, and it's one year out to maturity. Okay, so that you tell me, you can show me the behavior if it increases or decreases. And in this case, it's asking you for something called a digital call, and it tells you what that is. It pays one if S is bigger than K and zero otherwise and you're to draw these on the same graph. Okay, so let's, let's address that question. So there's K, so at maturity, it says it's one if you're bigger than K or zero otherwise, so the payoff has to look like that. If you're, say, one month from maturity, it's gonna be relatively close to the payoff, but smooth it out. Right? And if you're one year from maturity, it should be even more smooth. And the question is, well, okay, it's more smooth. Does it asymptotically approach one? This is one, right? According to the thing, it's at one or zero. Does it asymptotically approach one? No, what should it asymptotically approach? Discounted value of one. It's bounded above by one, so a bond bounds it, so therefore it cannot be larger than the discounted version of one dollar. So you've got to draw in another dotted line there and just say something like e to the minus r times one. One year contract. And it asymptotically approaches that. Okay, the next question there's another sketch. Portfolio four long puts, one long call, both struck at one. Okay, so tell me the strike is one, four long puts, one long call. How does that look? Oh, if you've got four long puts, struck at so that's going to be one. What's this point? We have four puts. So that should be four, right? If it was one put, it would, be, it would be one. And one long call, so the slope is one quarter that slope. 
and then pretty much you just have to sketch it out. So close to maturity, again, you'll be close to that. And this is asymptotically going to approach S minus K E to the negative. So one month is one twelfth times R. And then this is more or less the same thing as the as the uh the straddle or oh. so of course when you're sketching these I urge you don't do it in pen. Do it in pencil and then once you've got your once you're confident that you like the shape of it, then you could highlight it over and, and with a pen and indicate which is which. Okay? There you go. So pretty easy questions, I would say. But if you, if you didn't try one on your own, you would kind of fumble. And there is a bunch of exercises in the, the problem set. So here's a bunch of them that you can try. As well, to help you out, if you want to gain more intuition about the behavior, there is a file, which I don't see here. Okay. I will upload it. I think I might have deleted it by mistake. Hmm. Okay, I'll upload this for you. There's an Excel file that you can play with that allows you to to build portfolios out of whatever underlying assets you want. So here you put in the risk-free risk-free rate we didn't talk about dividends, uh, and I'm not even going to bother. I and mean, those of you who, who've seen it before, you know all you do, you basically you just modify by a little bit of a discount factor, right? It's not a huge issue. Um, you put in the volatility, you put in the maximum minimum spot price that you want to see on this. You put in the, there's, uh, you can put a stock, a bond, or a call, or a put. That's your basic building block. Your maturity dates, your strikes, how many of them you're going to hold, and then you get plots of the price and a bunch of other things, a bunch of other Greeks that we will talk about later on, Delta, Gamma, Vega, Rho, et cetera. So you can also play with the maturity date here and you can see that this, in fact, corresponded to one of the questions on the problem. Right? When maturity is zero, you get that payoff, which was one of the questions on the problems. And you can see what happens as you increase maturity, smoothen things out exactly in the way that I told you, you basically take your payoff and kind of smoothen it out. But you have to think about whether it stays above or below certain lines, right? And that's where you use these bounding arguments. And if you increase volatility, you can see what happens with the shape. Uh, you can keep the scale all the same. So increasing volatility in this case, you can see, does not always increase the value of an option, right? Unlike what you normally think. For basic puts and calls, it does. But here's a clear example where I'm increasing vol, and you can see the value increasing in one region but decreasing in another. Okay? And similarly, if we, let's just pick a moderate vol here, if we change interest rates as well, it's not obvious what happens. You get increasing in, in one, oh, I can't, here we go. In this case, actually, in this case, it's always decreasing because this is a bounded payoff. So you're okay for interest rate behavior. So I urge you to play with this and get comfortable with, you know, put in different types of portfolios that you'd like to play with and get a sense of how, how they behave with the parameters. You can only build that intuition by playing with a sheet like this, okay? I'll post it up on the site. All right, I think that's about all I would like to say about these um, behaviors. Any questions? Nope. All right. So now I want to go back to a little bit of theory, and then we'll do some example again. So the theory that I want to talk about is going back to this key result that we found in our last lecture. 
about the branching probabilities in this CRR model. Okay, so we found that if you take, um, if you calibrate to historical data, you have these probabilities that are approximately a half, plus some correction terms, and under P and under Q, you have two different probabilities showing up. Okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to really convince you that um, when you generate sample paths, so sample paths means start the asset at a particular value, flip a coin that has this probability of going up, and then decide whether it went up or not. But at the same time, use sort of the same fundamental coin, the same uniform random variable, to generate whether you went up or down with the P probabilities and the Q probability. And if you generate a sample path in this way, what you're going to see is there's some sort of strong relationship between the P paths and the Q paths. And one of the relationships that we know has to come out is that the variance of those paths have to be the same. That's one key result that we showed. Variance did not change. Under P and under Q, you had the same variance. But the drifts do change. Okay. And I want to, see, want to show you how that happens in this kind of continuous time setting. So let's um, go here. And I think this is my file that I'd like to open. So let's generate. Let, let me actually step through this code with you so that you get a sense of what it is that I'm actually doing. So we've got a few parameters set up here for our model. Okay, we're going to do 10 years out. We're going to take 100 steps. These are the sizes of my steps. This is the drift that we're going to put in for the uh, P measure. This is the volatility. That's our risk. Whoops. That's our risk-free rate. And then I'm calling this function called sim CRR. So let's go into there. What this does is, first of all, it calculates the P and the Q exactly as in the notes. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip, I'm going to generate a uniform random number between 0 and 1. Now, if that uniform random number, it, suppose we wanted to generate an outcome from the, the P measure. How would I generate that outcome? I generate a uniform random number, and then I simply check to see whether that uniform is smaller than P, smaller than my uptick probability. If it is, then that event is an event that I would say happened. That event happened, I should go up. Now, if the uniform is less, is bigger than P, then the event doesn't happen. Okay, that means I go down. So that's how I'm picking out whether I go up or down. That gives me these little Bernoulli random variables here. So I just check to see, is that uniform less than P? If it is, that number is 0 or 1. Okay, if it is, if it is it's 1, and if it's not, it's 0. So to generate something that is plus or minus 1 to tell me whether I go up or down, I multiply by 2 and I subtract 1. I do the same thing for the, for the Q path. So it's using the same uniform number. And this is because I want the same underlying probability space. I just want the outcomes to be different. I just want the pro or I should say, I have the same outcomes, the same path, but I want them to occur with their appropriate probability. P probability and Q probability. And then once I've got that, all I do is I, you know, sum up all of those, all of those paths, all of those x's for p, and they're multiplied by sigma square root delta t. So that's, uh, that's just this relationship, or where is it, the previous slide? There. That's just using this. A capital T is my initial value times the exponential of sigma square root delta t times the sum of the little x's. So that's what this little piece of code is doing for you. Okay, that's just doing that. And it's going to sum it up. It's going to take the first element, add it to the next, and then add it, add it, add it, and you're going to get a whole vector that's the sequential sum. And then I also do that for the Q paths. And then we're going to plot that. Okay, that's all it is. So something pretty simple. So let's run that. And we should have gotten, there we go. So here's an outcome from this tree. Okay, so under, so behind all of this, there's a big CRR tree embedded in there. Okay, there's a giant tree underlying there, and these little up or down ticks are representing 
the choice that happened when it flipped the uniform coin. Okay? So it drew the uniform random numbers, 100 of them, and then it decided, uh, for example, over here, they both, the P and the Q probabilities are actually, the P and the Q probabilities are fairly close to one another, actually. Let's take a, let's actually see where are they, P and Q. So P is about 0.52 and Q is, whoops. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it doesn't understand my writing there. <laughs> Q is about 0.49. Let me put P back there. Okay, Q is 0.49, say 0.5, and P is 0.52. So it's clear that it's more likely under the P probabilities that you're going to go up, right? Because the P probability is higher, so it's more likely that you're going to go up. And that's exactly what you see happening here. This blue path, this is a P, these are the P measure paths. Okay. And there are more times in which it goes up than the red paths. And you can see that they kind of match up at first, but then there's a point in which the probability the uniform was generated in between 0.52 and 0.5. So one went up and the other one went down. Okay. There's a 2% chance that you get one going up and the other one going down. Because Again, the difference between this and this is about 2%. So it's only if you generate something in between the two that you'll get the P path go up and the Q path go down. If it's smaller than this, you get they both go down. If it's bigger than this, they both go up. So it's only 2% chances that you actually have a deviation in the path. But, um, but you can see, even though there are some of these deviations that happen there, the variability, the general variability of the paths are very similar. You see that? Right? They're very similar. I mean, if you were to look at one path versus the other, you'd say, yeah, they have pretty much the same kind of variability. And that is reflecting the fact that the volatility along the P paths and the volatility along the Q paths are identical. Now, if we increase the number of points that we would like to generate here, so let's do 1,000, whoops. <laughs> Give me the keyboard, <laughs> zero, <laughs> there we go. So now you see what happens, of course, this little, these structures that we saw before, this very jagged edge structures become finer and finer. And this limiting procedure, in fact, is what's going to generate a Brownian motion at the end of the day. Right? We haven't really introduced Brownian motion yet, but that will be what our underlying, underlying process uh, behaves like. Uh, the important point that I want you to see is that, of course, the general drift of the Q path is lower than the P path. The P path drift is mu. The Q path drift is R. So this is not just a fictitious thing. It's not just some sort of mathematical calculation that we did. But actually, if you generate paths using those probabilities, you really do get the drift that, um, that the theory is telling you about. Now, the other thing we can do is we could run this over. So I can generate, say, 1,000 of these scenarios. And then look at the endpoints of those scenarios. Take its logarithm. And then compute the standard deviation and the mean of that, or look at that distribution and ask about the mean and standard deviation. And what should I find? Okay, let's, uh, that's done in this piece of, actually let's execute that. And then here I do 5,000 scenarios, so they're done. And which is which? This is Q, this is P. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so on the left you have the P histogram. Like I said, I've done this, th this 5,000 times and we've picked off just the endpoint, where the underlying asset actually ended up. And you can clearly see that the P distribution has a larger mean than the Q distribution. 
right? The mean of the Q distribution is somewhere around, I don't know, two or something like that. This is actually not taking the logs yet. This is just the underlying asset price. And I think if we look at uh, this here, it's going to tell us, yeah. So here are the two, here are the, 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 the first order or the first and second order statistics that we have. The P mean turned out to be about 0.8, the P standard deviation 0.63, the Q mean negative 0.1, and the Q standard deviation 0.63. How can I check if this is corresponding to my theory? What should theory say? Remember, this is taking log of the terminal value and taking the mean and expected value. Sorry, taking the mean and the variance. What should the P mean be, theoretically? What's the distribution under this, um, what's the distribution of the underlying asset according to theory when we take the infinite limit? Log normal, ah, uh, not mu star. Remember, convexity correction. Right. It's the exponential of a normal with mean mu star minus a half sigma star squared. So if I took the log, I'm going to end up with something that has a mean of mu minus a half sigma squared. So let's just check that. Mu minus 0 0.5 times sigma to be squared times t. Wow, why is that taking forever to do? Oh, I know why. It's lost the connection, and MATLAB is annoying in that it makes sure that you have the license from uh, the license file. So there we go. That's the answer, 0 0.8. What was the p mean? 0.798, so extremely close. Okay, so we basically matched it. And what about the uh, Q mean? What should that be? Remember, again, this is the Q mean of the logarithm of the underlying asset. So it should be R minus a half sigma squared, right? Minus 0.1. And again, that's pretty darn close. Simulation error. If I did this 10 million times, I would get exactly minus 0.1. What about the standard deviation? Well, we know that it should be sigma squared times t, 0.4, or sorry, square root of that, because I think I have standard deviation reported. So 0.6325, what did we get? 0 0.63, 0 0.63, okay? So it actually does work out. That, that's really just the point, is just to show you that, yeah, this all does work out nicely. And really to hammer home the fact that when you take a sample path from using the p-measure probabilities, you do get paths on a sample by sample basis that are drifted upwards relative to the Q path. Okay? All right. So the next topic that I'd like to, uh, to cover here, let's see. Okay, so, so far uh, what we've been discussing are assets that just take on a, some value in a tree. And so this is some giant tree and we've so far been viewing it as if, okay, I tell you what the value is at the end and then you can go ahead and figure out the values earlier on by doing discounted expectations. We know how to take continuous time limits so we know we can represent this in terms of an expectation of a random variable that's measurable or it's a random variable that we know its distribution of and uh, you can go ahead and use your standard calculus rules to compute that expectation. So these are really all of European style contingent claims, right? The fact that the option can mature only at maturity. So how do you deal with American style contingent claims? That's what I'd like to discuss. And I think we all more or less know what you do operationally, right? So what's the difference between an American style contingent claim versus European style? What's the key difference? American style is exercisable at any time, right? Okay. And there, in fact, may be various clauses in, in American style contingent claims. You may have regions in which you're allowed to exercise and other regions in which you're not. 
So one example, classic example, is an employee stock option. So if you are um, you're an employee or you're some sort of manager in a firm, often they will issue you a warrant for equity in the firm, and you cannot exercise that warrant. The warrant is basically the same as a call option. You cannot exercise that within the next two years. But after that, you can. So there may be blackout periods. So American, the standard American option is you can exercise at any time. But in principle, you can have blackout periods. Okay? So again, this simply means periods in which you are not allowed to exercise the claim. So let's um, uh, just go through the procedure very quickly, because again, I think you've all seen this before at some point or another. If you're at some arbitrary tree, uh, some arbitrary point in the middle of your tree, okay, suppose we've already figured out everything else and we're there, and we want to figure out how do we value this American option. So we already know the value in those two states of the world, and what we want is we want to know this value at that point. Well, it's a very simple thing. If you're sitting here at, at this point here, then there are really two things in front of you, two options in front of you. Either you hold the option, and you just, if you hold the option, you then have the potential of receiving either CU or CD in one time step from now, or you exercise the option. Right? Those are my two options. Those are the only two things you can do. So therefore, it makes rational sense to do whatever is better. So the actual value, so let's call this holding value H0 and this exercise value E0. So C0 is the maximum of hold or exercise. All right? That's all it is. It's very simple. You do whatever is better. Okay, well, what is the exercise value equal to? So if we think of a, uh, an American put, let's be very specific and think of an American put option. In that case, this is just K minus S0 plus. You agree? All right, if I immediately exercise, I'll get the value of the put. Now, if I hold the option, what should the value be? So if I'm holding on to the option, I'm not exercising it, that means that what I have in front of me are the two possibilities to get CU or CD in one time step from now. So that claim, that, that, that option of holding, actually is itself an option, right? It's an option to receive CU or CD, but we've already dealt with valuations of options of that kind. That is, in fact, just a standard one period claim. And so therefore, H0 has to be the value, the discounted expected value of C one time step from now. So in other words, it will be, if we do this in a tree, and then we would probably want to take small steps eventually, we'd use a discount factor like that, and we'd have the Q corresponding to that node. In the CRR model, we already know this Q is constant everywhere. Right? It's the same Q. In general models, it won't be, but in the CRR model, it's just constant. So we'd have this, and then one minus QCD. And you're taking the maximum of those two things, and then you choose, and, and that's it. Then you're done. Because once you've figured out what C0 is, every other part of the tree looks exactly the same. If I think of, a, if I think of building this, say, a two-step tree, for example, and I've already gotten the value here by taking that maximum. I use the same procedure. I get the value there, right, the exact same procedure. I decide on which is, which is better, buy or hold, sorry, hold or exercise, whatever is better. I compute both of them. I get a value, and then I finally get my value here as well. And I can just repeat this through the entire tree. Operationally, it's trivial. But 
even though operationally it's trivial, there's an, important, um, there's an important concept embedded in there. And that is when there are going to be some nodes in which this is optimal and some nodes in which this is optimal. And if you label, if you, if you go through your tree, and let's, um, I'm going to just draw a whole bunch of nodes here. I'm going to try to do it. really quickly. Okay. So suppose we went through this tree and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to color wherever it's optimal to hold, I'm going to color it um, blue and wherever it was optimal to exercise, I'm going to color it red. Okay. Well, if you're, if you're an American put, you know that it will be optimal to exercise at maturity whenever you are below K, right, K or below. So there's going to be some set of nodes here below which they'll be red and above which they will be blue. Now, it turns out you can show that the pattern that you will receive, that you will get by doing this, always looks like that. The reds, where you exercise, always lie below the blues. Where you exercise is lying below the blues. And there's, this obviously creates sort of two regions in space. Right. There's this sort of region here that's separated from the other region. And that region, this is called your exercise region, And the other region is a continuation region. And when we get to continuous time settings, you'll see how this changes into partial differential equations with free boundaries. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a point where these two regions sort of meet, this layer here. That layer is the optimal exercise curve. Okay, so why is that thing called an optimal exercise curve? How does it operationally work? Well, if you're following an asset price dynamic, so you're starting here, you're going to go through this tree the very first time that you hit that optimal exercise curve, it's actually best to exercise then. You will never, uh, never get to this node in an optimal way without exercising. In other words, this is an upper bound of that entire region, so once you hit it, you make sure you exercise. Now, the way I've drawn it there is not how it typically looks. If you do this in with many, many steps, um, you'll get much more reasonable behavior. So you'll find that for put options, the optimal exercise curves trace out something that looks like that. So this is S, this is time, that's maturity, that's K. The yellow region, this exercise region is something like, is somewhere below, a nice smooth curve, and the continuation region is up there, okay? That's what you generally find. Now, you can, um, it's easy to do these computations just, you know, one step at a time and so on, but I want you to see how this, how this evolves when you take multiple steps. So, uh, let's see, what I'd like to do is pull up a MATLAB file for you, but maybe before I do that, is this concept clear? Have people done this before? Who has not seen this before? Okay, so would you like to see an example? Yes, an example. Okay, so the example is best done in Excel rather than me writing down numbers and then I'll send you the sheet. Or I'll post the sheet, that is.
Okay, so we're going to have the underlying asset price, the risk-free rate, the volatility, and um, the step size. Okay, so let's say this is 100. Risk-free rate is, say, 2%. The volatility is 20, 20%. Let's take steps of um, one month, okay, 1 over 12. So the way I will do this is this is, um, this is S0. This is my risk-free rate. This is my volatility. This is my volatility. This is my DT. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to build a tree, let's say, four steps out. Okay? So to do that, I also need to know my up and down ticks. So this is the exponential of sigma times square root of DT. Okay? That's my up and down, up and down, up down value. So this is S naught here. That's time zero, time one, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six. Let's do six steps. Okay, so it's a six-month contract. So rather than, uh, when you, whenever you do this stuff in Excel, by the way, rather than looking at the tree this way, up, down, rotate the tree 45 degrees. Okay? Rotate it 45 degrees. That way, going across really means going up. And... Going this way means going down, okay? So this is just the same tree rotated 45 degrees. Okay? So that means when I go across here, it equals this times u, oh, sorry, times the up value. Okay, that's my outcomes if I went up, 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 up. And over here, uh, I'm going down. So it's my previous value divided by the up value, right? Because it's e to the negative sigma square root delta t. Can you see this, or is this too small? You can see it? It's fine. Okay, speak up. Otherwise, I don't know. Okay, and um, yeah, and so we can just copy this across. And did I get them all? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Good. Yeah, that's correct. I need seven states by the end of a six-step tree, right? Every step I have one more. So I've got them all. So you can see if I went, I went up and then that's down, right? This would be up and then going there would be a down step. And I got back to 100. I go up, I go back down, that's 100. If I go down, down, up, I get to there. Sorry, that's wrong. Down, down, sorry. <laughs> Start there, go down, go down, go up, and go back up again. I went down twice, up twice, I got back to 100. So the tree is correct. Okay, so this is my asset price tree. Okay, and uh, then we'll have the value of the option tree, okay, option value tree. So let's put a strike, let's say, I don't know, might as well put 100. So what do I do? We go out here to the last step of the tree and the option payoff for, uh, for an American option is the same as its European counterpart, right? That's the only day on which you can exercise, so you decide whether you do. So it's the maximum of the strike, which I didn't give a name here, okay? Okay, maximum strike minus the corresponding value in that tree. A maximum of that and zero. Okay. Okay, so I get all of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, there we go. So that's my payoff. And now all I do is I use the discounted expectation stuff. Well, might as well compute Q and keep it over here because we use it everywhere, right? The Q probability. So what is it? It's the exponential of RF times DT minus um, the down tick divided by the uptick minus one over the down tick. Okay, you can just go ahead and calculate and check that that's the case. And I called it up, not u. Okay, so it's almost exactly five by coincidence here. 
system. Perhaps if I change this volatility, I get, yeah, there we go, get something a little bit bigger. Maybe point, point 0.3, let's do point 0.3. Okay, so um, what value goes here? Well, in principle, I mean, I can, I can just do the calculation, right? I can say discounted expectation, the whole value. What's the whole value? Discounted expectation, that's my whole value. I have two outcomes of zero, so the discounted expected value is zero, clearly. And what's the exercise value? It's also zero, right? It's out of the money. At this node, that node corresponds to that node, right? So it's actually zero. It's out of the money, so it's, both cases are zero. Whenever you have an equality, you usually just choose the whole value. You just don't exercise the option. You just hold it. So in formulaically, we can do it like this. We can take the maximum of discounted value of, oh, I need Q. Okay, I'll call, I'll, I'll introduce a variable called Q up in a second. Times payoff there plus one minus Q up times the payoff going down, close bracket, that versus maximum strike minus the corresponding spot value. Okay, and yes, it's giving me an error because I didn't call this thing anything, Q up, okay? Okay, so this is, this is just implementing exactly this, um, that formula there, maximum of H0 and E0 whole value versus exercise value. And all I have to do is come copy this formula over. Okay. And that tells me the value of the option. So using this method, I can't really tell which one, where the exercise points were, can I? Because it doesn't, it doesn't store that for me. But I can create another cell here that, that does that. I can say equals um, if, for example, this is bigger, sorry, if it's smaller than um, the exercise, immediate exercise value, which is maximum of strike minus the spot, then let's just put an exclamation mark or let's put a number sign actually. Then it'll put that, otherwise it'll put nothing. I hope that works. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so it's not giving me anything at maturity because I put strict equality, but ah, that's strange. Sorry. There we go. Okay, I think I have the formulas copied in all of the cells that need to be. But these little number signs are showing me where I should be exercising. Okay, so it's saying I should exercise at the node corresponding to this one and not this node here. Right, I could replace it with um, putting another sim symbol there. So the exercise boundary in this case is nice and simple. It's just, in terms of this tree, it's just a straight line here. As soon as I hit this cell, I would exercise. And if you wanted to get fancy, you could make it color these cells to tell you when to exercise, right? So according to this, it's using those cells as the exercise points, if the asset ever hits that. Okay, so that's a simple example. Um, I'll save that for you later. And let's take a look at how this actually plays out if we do this in multiple. In multiple steps. Okay, plot, time, comma. 
boundary. Okay, so this is a setup to do 100 steps, and now you're starting to see that shape that I was drawing for you, right? Remember, I was claiming that once you do this in continuous time, you're going to get this thing that eventually becomes a nice downward sloping curve. And uh, if we increase the number of points even more, um, I actually don't remember what what parameter represents number of points here. <laughs> Let me see. It's the last one. Okay, good. Two thousand. So this is a thousand steps, and you just can see it's getting finer and finer, finer and finer. And um, we could actually just stop there and just um, ask some questions. Is that behavior reasonable? So does it make sense, first of all, that that optimal exercise boundary which splits the exercise region from the no exercise region, is it reasonable that it approaches 100? It is, because at maturity you know you should exercise at 100. Now it turns out that there's a very funny thing with call options. Call options, it turns out, when there are no dividends, it's never optimal to exercise early. But if there is a dividend, it also turns out that the call option, it, the shape for call options are kind of reflected from the put. So call, optimal exercise boundary, kind of looks like this. Looks like that. But it doesn't always hit K. For a call option, you may in fact find situations where the boundary doesn't go down below K, stays above it. And this depends on the number of the dividends. So this is for call, this is for put, and only with dividends. I don't think I want to get into the details as to why exactly that happened and how. There's a little bit of analysis necessary for you to show that, but I'll tell, that's the behavior. Uh, what is kind of interesting and what we can uh, what we can try to assess right now is how should, for the put option, let's just stick with the put option, how should this boundary behave as we change some of the parameters? So suppose you were to increase volatility. What do you think should happen to this optimal exercise boundary? Remember, the idea of the optimal exercise boundary is that if the asset price is moving around, uh, let's copy this figure and uh, paste it over here. Oh, where'd it go? Okay, so if the asset price is moving, the instant that you touch it, that's when you should exercise. if that was the underlying asset price dynamics, if it actually evolved that way. That's the optimal exercise point. This is why it's called an optimal exercise curve. So how should that curve behave if I increase volatility? What's your intuition? Hmm? More convex? And what do you mean by more convex? So it goes like this. Like this. So you think it's here? Okay. Okay, so why? What's the intuition for that? There is a good intuition for it. Volatility increases. My paths become much wilder, right? So the actual probability of exercise doesn't change much. With a lower path, if I, if, I, if I kept the same exercise curve, suppose I kept that exercise curve, but volatility increases. 
then it's more likely I'm going to hit that original exercise curve because my paths are more volatile. And that turns out to be suboptimal to do. It's more optimal to wait longer and have the opportunity that the asset drops deeper in the money because that is a likely path. The asset price dropping is actually a likely path when vol is high. If vol is low, the asset value dropping is not a likely path. So my exercise region would be much tighter. Does that make sense? So the curves generally do this as vol increases. And um, let's see if we can let's see if we can illustrate that by just uh, running that code again with a different volatility. Let's increase volatility. Let's go to point um, point three. Okay. And uh, what's my range before? This range was down to seventy. So well, you can immediately see that it's clearly um, clearly going lower. Sorry, I want to put it side by side. Oh, it doesn't want to do that. <laughs> Maybe I can do this. Uh, da -da -da, there. Okay. We can see that this this is dropping below 65, and this stayed above 75, so it's, it's clearly dropping below. It does that. So that's one parameter. Now, what about um, interest rates? What do you think should happen for interest rates? So let's go back to point two volatility, but let's decrease interest rates. What's going to happen? This one's a little surprising. Okay. It also went down. In fact, going down even more. If interest rates are zero, it's in fact never optimal to exercise. This is all just computational noise. Okay. This is just computational noise. So you get a similar behavior um, with R decreasing. Okay. The curves move down with a decreasing R. And you can argue why that's the case, uh, or at least argue why it's suboptimal when there's zero interest rates by using Jensen's inequality. So do you, do you all know Jensen's inequality? You think you can prove this with Jensen's inequality? OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you Jensen's inequality. And then that's going to be your little quiz for today. Okay. 